Welcome to Backyard Philosophy, a podcast where a couple friends grab some cold ones, sit around the fire, and talk about science, philosophy, and history. Crack one open, sit back, and get a good laugh as we discuss everything from automation to why the meaning of life is 42. For this Christmas mini episode, we're going to talk about a time when reindeers brought gifts to a bunch of sailors. I'm going to start out by reading a letter sent from Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, Gage, under President William McKinley, to Captain Tuttle of the U.S. Revenue Service Bear. The U.S. Revenue Service is the early adaptation of the Coast Guard, and they patrolled the waters up in Alaska, keep neighboring countries away from American ships, and make sure everyone was taking their fair share of fish, but also to make make sure all those whalers paid their fair share of taxes. That's where the revenue part comes in. IRS always gets what it's owed, Nick. Always. They really do. And But this time, they're going to be the good guys. Wait, what? Yep. Like I said, they were the Coast Guard. They're out there to help people and get their money. Gage starts off his letter with, To Captain Tuttle of the Bear, The best information obtainable gives the assurance of truth to the reports that a fleet of eight whaling vessels are icebound in the Arctic Ocean, somewhere in the vicinity of Point Barrow, and that the 265 persons who were, at last accounts, on board these vessels are in all probability in dire distress. These conditions call for prompt and energetic action looking to the relief of the imprisoned whale. Men. It is therefore has been determined to send an expedition to the rescue. Believing that your long experience in Arctic work, your familiarity with the region of Arctic Alaska from Point Barrow south and the coastline washed by the Bering Sea, from which you but recently returned, your known ability and reputation as an able and competent officer all especially fit you for the trust. You have been selected to command the relief expedition. Your ship, the Bear, will be officered by a competent body of men and manned by a crew of your own selection. The ship will be fully equipped, fitted, and provision for all the perilous work in view, for such it must be under the most favorable conditions. It is, of course, well understood that at this advanced season of the year, the route to the Arctic Ocean through the Bering Straits will be closed to you, and because of this known condition, you will not attempt it. Therefore, your efforts will be directed to establishing communication by means of an overland expedition with the whaling fleet, not only for the purpose of succoring the people, but to cheer them with the information that their relief and ultimate rescue will be effected as soon as the conditions in Bering Straits will permit your command to advance. With this purpose steadily in view, you will prepare an expedition of at least two commissioned officers and one forward or petty officer of your command to undertake, from a landing that you will effect, the journey overland to Point Barrow. You will assign an officer to the charge of this expedition, furnishing him with such written instructions for the government of his party as in your judgment and discretion will dictate as most likely to further the success of this undertaking. From there, he goes to talk about the different routes that the bear could take to effect a rescue. So the Treasury has informed the captain of the bear. But Nick, how about you give us a little information on what year we're dealing with? So the year is currently 1897. The bear just got back from their Arctic patrol, and they're at port somewhere in Washington. And most of the ships had left the Arctic Circle because of the ice, but everyone's always trying to push it to get that one last whale, make that last buck, and all these ships got trapped up there when everyone was supposed to flee because these are all wooden ships. Even the bear, which is a steamer, was still a wooden hold vessel it could not stand up against the ice for an engineering standpoint for modern day boats having steel hulls kind of makes a big difference when you're running into ice and even today we're trying to specialize and make better hulls for ships so i can't even imagine 19th century late 19th century you got the letter of hey some ships are trapped up there by ice in alaska one of the <laughs> coldest places during winter and you have to go rescue them oh boy that's uh that's a tall order he talks about the crew and saying, you'll make your own selection from the personnel of your command, volunteers preferred, of the officers who you deem best fitted physically and otherwise, to encounter the hardships incident to the trip in view. You don't want anyone who doesn't want to be there on this expedition, and we'll run into that later on in our journey. It says there are several plans deemed feasible, all leading to the same end, by the adoption and execution of someone of which the primary purpose of the expedition, as above given, can be accomplished. The first and great need of the whalemen will probably 
probably be food. It is believed that the only practical method of getting it to them is to drive it on the hoof. The officer placed in charge of it should be fully instructed upon the following general lines. 1. Communicate as quickly as possible with W.T. Lop at Cape Prince of Wales with a native named Artisarlook, generally known as Charlie. Failing these, then with Kitterson, Superintendent Government Reindeer Station at Unilackley. The purpose is to collect from the herds at Rodney and Cape Prince of Wales the entire available herd of reindeer, all to be driven to Point Barrow. Mr. Lop is to take charge of this herd and make all necessary arrangements for herders, sleds, and dogs, and the necessary food for use of the party must be landed from the ship. Such clothing as can be carried should be transported. It is suggested that a reindeer might carry a light pack, say, 40 pounds. Mr. Lott must be fully impressed with the importance of the work in hand and with the necessity of bending every energy to its speedy accomplishment. He must also make arrangements providing sledges and so forth for transporting the overland expedition from your command to Point Hope. When the deer are collected and the start made, the party from the bear should travel with them as far as Coatsabue Sound to make certain that they are properly started on their route. That point being reached, one officer and a necessary driver should then push on ahead along the coast to Point Hope, leaving the other officers and Mr. Lott to follow with the herd over the route selected to reach Point Barrow. If the situation is found, as now anticipated, to be desperate, the officers must take charge in name of the government and organize the community for mutual support and good order, apportioning the provisions on hand and slaughter as many reindeers as necessary, which it is hoped will have arrived, for food, to make all hold out until August 1898 when you will arrive in the bear. Such reindeer as are left will be turned over to the Presbyterian Mission at Point Barrow. It also sounds like to me, Nick, that a bunch of salty sea sailors in the 19th century are about to be cowboys and use dog sleds to herd reindeer towards the stuck ships in the Arctic. Not just any cowboys, Arctic cowboys. (laughs) Arctic. I didn't know that was a thing until now. Oh, boy. The people at Point Barrow must be divided, some sent along the coast to Point Hope and others among the natives to the south. There isn't enough food and shelter at Point Barrow to house all those people, and so once they get there, then they have to take care of them, and he's suggesting how to do that. No opportunity for hunting, sealing, or whaling, whereby the food supply may be added to, must be neglected, and provisions must be made for the natives employed. Any chance they had to get food, take it, is what he was saying there. I mean, dead of winter in Alaska? You can't be picky, that's for sure. Yep, and the the bear while they were waiting for the ice to thaw there's a pretty cool picture of them killing a polar bear and bringing it up on the ship all right so salty sailors who are not going to be cowboys with dog sleds to herd reindeer are also killing polar bears to eat how is this not a movie yet nick I have no idea. The officer in charge of the overland expedition, from whatever point started, must be instructed to deal firmly and judiciously with every situation that may confront him, particularly after arrival at Point Barrow, he bearing in mind that he represents the government on the spot. Finally, having succeeded in landing the overland expedition with adequate instructions, you will seek such harbor as you may deem proper to await results in the opening of navigation in the Bering Straits. Basically, once you uh, drop those guys off on their overland expedition, just waiting for the ice to melt. It comes down to two simple points. Food must be gotten to the starving men, and the best and most feasible method of doing this is to be adopted. By any means necessary, get them food. Before sailing from Seattle, you will procure as many suitable sleds as you deem necessary, fitted with necessary pertinences as sleeping bags, etc. In one letter, they even said to bring kayaks. Anyway, he closes it out, saying, Mindful of your arduous and perilous expedition upon which you are about to enter, I bid you, your officers and men, Godspeed upon your errand of mercy and wish you a successful voyage and safe return. Boy, that's a tall order. And for those who don't know, never even maybe even seen snow, because moving to Texas, yes, Nick, I always have to mention Texas, there are people who not seen snow when you're a ship in the north you can easily run into ice packs now you think oh well why can't you just you know sail around avoid them no everything becomes frozen it's like running into mud the deeper you get in the more stuck and more heavy everything gets so these ships could be landlocked by ice so just imagine a ship just stuck in the middle of a a bay or an ocean just surrounded by ice and no land in sight pretty much and part of the problem is those ships that were frozen up there, the ice can crush their holes and sink those ships. So we know those ships are stuck up there, but we don't know if they're still floating or what condition they're in. Or, I mean, they could have all been sunk by the ice. So they got to get moving. I mean, this is, like you said, Nate, the late 19th century. They're still whale hunting for fat and oil to 
to burn. Like you don't have radio, you don't have GPS, you don't have communications. You, I mean, letters is the only way you can send it. I mean, what, less than less than two decades before this time period is when the first uh, transcontinental railroad was finished? Yeah, it's uh, this is a long time ago. So they effected landfall at Cape Vancouver on the 6th of December, 1897. That's as far north as they could get a ship, even a steamer, which was, the bear was, a, it wasn't an icebreaker, like I said, didn't have a wooden hole, but it did its fair share of moving ice around, and it was an impressive ship, and it got farther than any other ship could have, I'm sure. I imagine the bear, since all of them being seasoned sailors for that terrain and area, they, they can kind of read the land better than anyone else. So, Captain Tuttle of the bear set out his next highest ranking officer, Jarvis, his second in command, second lieutenant, Berthoff the uh, ship's surgeon, Samuel J. Call, and an enlisted man, Kolchoff. They set out with 1,500 pounds of equipment on four sleds pulled by huskies. The crew remarked that the speed at which they traveled seemed incredibly slow. That makes sense since they're used to sailing on a steam-powered boat instead of being pulled across the frozen ground by dogs. These men had little, if any, experience of running sleds through the Arctic, which is a dangerous task in itself. <laughs> They're also all white men, and they passed through many villages, and some of these villages had never seen a white man before, which caused the villagers to be alarmed and set the crew on edge. Seeing that some of the sled dogs were exhausted, Jarvis left Berthoff and Koltif and a Russian guide to let the weaker dogs rest. The team would meet up later around Cape Blossom. The rescue party had been lucky with a few bad days of moderate weather. That changed around Christmas Eve, Jarvis wrote, the temptation to remain over Christmas was great, but our mission would not permit any unnecessary delay. On the 25th of December, 1897, the rescue party ran into a blizzard. The blizzard froze the edge of the snow into glass-like ice, which wound up cutting the paws of the huskies. Oh, those poor puppies. Jarvis followed the Yukon River to its mouth and then crossed the ice to arrive at St. Michael on the 30th of December. And not only are they stuck, not only is the crew trying to get them doing a task they've never really done before, I imagine... Not that many people have gone dog sledding, and now they're running into a blizzard and their dog's feet are cut up. This seems a bit like a hell situation. And occasionally having to seek shelter in villages who have never seen a white man, who you don't know the language. Yeah, just the language barrier, let alone never seeing another person of different skin color. That's gotta... When they said put themselves on edge, that's a nice way of saying it. That's gotta be scary as hell. At St. Michael, Jarvis traded out his huskies for some new dogs and quickly set out again. January 1st, 1898, the rescue crew ran into Mr. Tilton, the third mate on the Belvedere, which is one of the eight trapped ships. Tilton reported the Orca, Freeman, and Belvedere sailed clear of the ice at Point Barrow, making it all the way to the Seahorse Islands. The Orca then became crushed on the ice while the Freeman was abandoned by its crew. The crew from the Orca and Freeman took shelter on the Belvedere. Tilton brought other information about the location of the other whaling ships. You can see up top here, the Belvedere the far west is the closest one and then you have the other ones that are still alive the rosario the fearless and newport and the genie and they're all the way down here at saint michael's well at least they're getting some news at least some of the ships are alive they're not all lost at sea exactly any news is good news the rescue crew passed unilaclic on the 5th of january 1898 on the 8th the snow started coming down so thick that the sled dogs became ineffective the sailors had to use snowshoes and walk ahead of the dogs to create a path for them to follow Oh, Jesus. I can't imagine getting that sweaty and that wet during a blizzard and that cold. Hypothermia, I don't know how they stave that off. The 11th of January, 1898, in Golovin Bay, Jarvis again swapped out his tired dogs for some fresh legs. Reindeer legs. He also got a new sled, the Lapland sled, that was closer to a boat than a sled, and specifically designed to be pulled by reindeer. This wasn't uncommon in Alaska. The United States brought reindeer over from Siberia in an effort to help feed the natives. I think they brought 17 reindeer over from Siberia that were paid for by, I think it was like the Secretary of Education or something of Alaska, but these, these higher-up guys wanted to help feed the the struggling native population. So they brought in reindeer from Siberia, but the government finally gave them the okay, but they wouldn't help them pay for it. Eventually, they got enough reindeer that they were able to manage them and grow them and distribute them around the country. And they were used for pulling supplies, but mostly for food. And one of the great things about the reindeer compared to the dogs, the dogs, you have to bring fish or meat or something for them to eat. But the reindeer, they can use their horns to graze. They remove the snow and just eat the grass and stuff that's there. So you don't really need to worry about packing food for them. 
that seems like a win-win. And Nick, I don't know if this is a, something weird about me, but I'm very curious. What do reindeer taste like? Uh, I don't know if I've ever eaten reindeer, but I'm assuming they taste pretty similar to regular deer. Only one way to find out, Nick. Only one way to find out. Get trapped in the Arctic? <laughs> let's, let's do it, Nick. Let's, let's get some dog sleds and go to the Arctic. The reindeer, like I said, they're pretty close to regular deer. They're a lot more skittish than the huskies, a lot more nervous. And after 36 days, the sailors had finally gotten used to the sled dogs, and now they had to learn an entirely new animal and new sleds. Those sailors just can't win. But like you said, Nick, at least the sled's a little bit more similar to a boat, so maybe maybe a little bit of an edge. Maybe not. Not quite sure. On the 14th of January, the crew ran into a blizzard, and the deer were losing strength. But luckily, they made it to the village of Opkatilla. The crew waited out the blizzard in a native hut while the reindeer got their strength back. The storm did not let up, and Jarvis was restless. On the 17th of January, he saddled up his reindeer, and the crew set out in howling wind, snowfall, and below zero temperatures. I must say, Nick, it's a little off topic. I love how many different names and spellings of all these words are. It's making me very happy to feel your hesitation to say them. Luckily, I've heard a lot of these names before from James Michener's Alaska book, so that was the first one I hadn't seen before, so I don't know how that went. <laughs> Jarvis wrote in his log, We had made it to the next village, some 35 miles away, for it was out of the question to pitch a tent in such weather. Tramping alongside the sleds and beating ourselves to keep warm, there were times when we anxiously looked for the protecting ice of Cape Nome. In the middle of the day, we would see the sun, a red ball through the driving snow, but everything else on a level was a winding, blinding sheet. As we worked along, Long, seeing nothing, buffeted about by the fierce gust, it seemed as if we would certainly pay dearly for our temerity. In the afternoon, the storm suddenly lulled, and we found ourselves under the lee of Cape Nome. We now breathed easier, and several hours later, made our camp at the village of Kabethluk on the west side of the Cape. Jarvis woke up the next morning to get his reindeer together, only to find that the villagers' sled dogs had ran them off during the night. The crew had to round up their reindeer and set off later that night after the delay. Jarvis's feet were so cold from tramping around in the snow looking for for his reindeer, he rode through the night, kicking his feet together to keep them from freezing. Just, oh, I can't imagine, and perhaps not even be able to see your hand from your face because it's pitch whiteness. I mean, all that snow, maybe, maybe depending on where you are on this trip, some trees, some mountains, hills, it could just be just flat land, could not. It, it's gotta be so hard to navigate. And just to stay warm, now granted you're moving, but that wind chill, you wouldn't happen to know the temperatures they were dealing with. What did you, Nick? The next day, they they set out in temperatures of 40 below. 40 below. I, I feel like most people have no idea how cold that actually is to actually feel that. Yeah. It's, uh, why do I live in a place where it hurts to breathe? <laughs> So January 19th, the crew reached the home of Charlie Artzerluk, the man Secretary of the Treasury Cage had told the rescuers to get reindeer from. Jarvis told Charlie that the U.S. government would reimburse him for his reindeer. Jarvis had Surgeon Call drive Charlie's herd, and he took off ahead to Port Clarence and the Teller Reindeer Station in temperatures of 40 below. Jarvis arrived at the home of Mr. Lop, the Teller Station Superintendent. Lop helped the native Alaskans raise reindeer to survive and was extremely knowledgeable. As such, Jarvis asked him to accompany him on his mission. Lop's wife told him to go, and the residents of Teller also gifted Jarvis and Lop 301 reindeer. A few days later, Surgeon Call and Charlie arrived with additional deer. Lop hired six of the best reindeer herders out of Teller for the final 700-mile journey. The group departed Teller Station with 438 reindeer and 18 sleds on February 3rd. That's a lot of meat. It's a lot of food. The reindeer had trouble pulling the heavy sleds, and Jarvis set out to find some dogs. He had trouble rounding up enough dogs because the villages this far north were pretty poor, and as such not had many dogs, much less dogs to spare. Some of the natives along for the trip became more detrimental than helpful. The natives were less disciplined than the men Jarvis was used to working with, and ended up consuming more than their fair share of food, and once they saw the food supply dwindling, a few abandoned the expedition. Berthoff and Kulchif had split up earlier and had planned to meet Jarvis's group at Cape Blossom with all the provisions they had gathered. Jarvis not heard anything from Berthoff and was relieved to find him and the provisions at Cape Blossom when he arrived. Jarvis did not want to sit for Lop and the reindeer, so he and Call set out for Point Hope. Jarvis seemed pleased as he departed for Point Hope, writing that they left in ideal weather, negative 42 degrees below zero. <laughs> I guess everyone has their own definition ideal, and I guess uh, it could always be worse, right, Nick? It could always be negative 43. It's all relative. Jarvis and the surgeon arrived at the Hope Whaling Station on February 20th. 
At Point Hope, they heard some of the first news from the trapped ships since Mr. Tilton. The news was surprisingly good that their food supplies were being diminished but not depleted. Three deaths had occurred and the whalers did fear scurvy setting in. Jarvis left Point Hope on March 6. When Jarvis reached the mouth of the Pitmia River, they found a note from Lop that said the deer were tired, they crossed the mountains, and the herd was in good shape. Jarvis began to relax nearing the end and wrote, The last great obstacle had been overcome, and though the cold, strong winds were hard to face, it was now a straight drive over level country to Point Barrow. Human nature could not accomplish more than had been done, so pushing on until nightfall, we went into camp, feeling we had things well in hand to go to the end of the journey. Jarvis wanted to catch up to Lodz and his reindeer, but the weather was working against him. The 15th of March, Jarvis wrote in his log, Our dreams of catching up with the herd were gone this morning, for the wind had increased during the night, and by the time we awoke, it was blowing a gale. It was all we could do to keep the tent from blowing down, so we cut blocks of ice and built a barricade around our camp that kept off some of the wind. But it was anything but comfortable. During the day, the thermometer registered 40 to 45 degrees below zero, which is unusually low with so much wind. So close to the end, a new problem appeared. Hungry sled dogs, whose food was depleted after the journey, the huskies began to eat everything that was not wood or metal, including canvas, deerskin, and ropes. When the huskies were fed, the men had to kill the larger huskies to keep them from eating the smaller dogs. Oh my god. You're telling so they get some assistance from random people that eat more of their food, so they kind of, they leave. Now you've got, you're already going against uneven terrain, cold weather, wind, just not knowing their final destination, and now your dogs are eating each other. Oh my god. On March 17th, Jarvis caught up to the deer herd and lop and continued on. On the 26th of March, Jarvis climbed aboard the Belvedere. His report reads, We drew up alongside about 4 p.m. and going aboard announced ourselves and our mission, but it was some time before the first astonishment and incredulousness could wear off. The men of the Belvedere were surviving, but not in good condition due to only eating two meals a day. Jarvis, never taking a break, was off the next morning, making it all but 15 miles to Point Barrow, where he camped for the night. The next day, the sky cleared and turned into a beautiful day. Lieutenant Jarvis later recounted the final days of the Overland Expedition. Though the mercury was negative 30 degrees, I was wet through with perspiration from the violence of our work. Our sleds were racked and broken, our dogs played out, and we ourselves scarcely able to move when we finally reached the Cape. Jarvis's entered into Point Barrow on March 28th after completing the longest journey above the Arctic Circle and the dead of winter that had ever been attempted. When Jarvis and Dr. Call finally arrived at Barrow, Jarvis recounted that, when we greeted some of the officers of the wrecked vessels, whom we knew, they were stunned. It was some time before they could realize that we were flesh and blood. Some looked off to the south to see if there was not a ship in sight. Others wanted to, not, to know if we had come up in a balloon. Had we not had we not been so well known, I think they would have doubted that we really did come in from the outside world. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine you running out of food supplies. Well, luckily it's cold. But at least your food won't go rotten. You can leave it, literally put it outside to freeze. But landlocked, completely cut off from the outside world. And not only did these sailors go above beyond the call, they made history by doing something utterly ridiculous. So much more were the sa the other sailors were asking if you came by a hot air balloon. Oh, Nick, this is a great story. I think it's one of the best ironies, right? Like, the largest amphibian assault was done by the Army, and the largest overland expedition was done by the Coast Guard. <laughs> that is a bit, a bit irony. I never thought about that. So now they got the supplies to Point Barrow and the sailors, but now he had to keep these men alive all winter for the rest of the winter. Surgeon Call went to see where the men were housed and walked into a barracks with 78 men in close quarters and covered in suit from the oil lamps they used to warm. Jarvis set out right away, began constructing new quarters, dispensing soap, and having the men wash their clothes. On March 30th, Lop arrived with 382 reindeer of the initial 448. Once the reindeer were settled, Lop took a team of huskies and went home with messages for the crew of the bear. It is pretty incredible that they kept way past the majority of those reindeer alive. Yeah, I was just about to say, like, you, you, only, you only lost, what, about 50 or 60 reindeer going that much distance? But I feel bad for Lop, where he, get, he gets there, gets reindeer, and goes, well, I gotta go back now and tell everyone that we, we made it. <laughs> There's no, ra no radio, no snap phone. You have to go all the way back. That's gotta be so disheartening. Yep, <laughs> they lost 66 reindeer, but he, he's the reindeer farmer from Teller, so he's just going home to his wife. 
Oh, okay. Well, at least, at least, well, that probably explains why he lost so few reindeer, but still to, to try to go back during the middle of winter after going off this hard, treacherous journey, that's got to... I don't know if that'd be optimism to try to make it home or that'd be sad to have to double back and go all the way back home. Well, either way, it wasn't fun going there and it's not going to be fun getting home. (laughs) So Jarvis had to keep the crew of all the ships alive just under 500 sailors with little discipline as well as keep peace between the natives who didn't want the sailors there and the sailors who did not want to be there. Jarvis spent his time inspecting the quarters of the men, the stranded ships, suppressing mutinies, care for fawning deer, and maintaining order. Surgeon Call was busy as well, with both natives and whalers, dealing with everything from frostbite to amputations. Call only lost one man in his care to heart disease. Oh, that's not even his fault, then, if it's heart disease. No, especially for 1898. Yeah. The bear was able to leave its port in Unalaska on June 14th and make its way up to Cape Prince of Wales after breaking through some ice where they received word of Jarvis's successful journey. The bear slowly smashed her way to Point Barrow and at 5 a.m. on the 28th of July, Point Barrow was in view and Jarvis was welcomed aboard as a hero. Two weeks. Two weeks to slowly go through that ice with the ship bear. On the 13th of September, 1898, the bear returned to Seattle with Jarvis completing his mission. That's, oh God, I can't imagine saying that discipline, because one little mistake, you get a cut, you you go a little stir crazy, like you, you mentioning you worry about scurvy, not having f- fresh fruit and vegetables. That's, they had everything going against them. They had, yeah, inhospitable terrain, unfriendly cultures foreign cultures foreign land some of the worst conditions on the planet and you were timed (laughs) yeah if you mess up people die that oh god that pressure and time stamp that's a hard one and they did it was 1500 miles departed december 6th arrived march 30th jeez so i think we can say fairly certain that santa chose the right animals to pull his sleigh Oh, that's for sure. Perfect with the season right here upon us. Reindeer leading the way for everyone. I was going to close this one out with the quote, since I know you're such a big fan of quotes, Mike. That I am. If you are subjected to miserable discomforts, or even if you suffer, it must be regarded as all right and simply a part of life. Like sailors, you must never dwell too much on the dangers or sufferings, lest others question your courage. Lieutenant David Jarvis, U.S. Revenue Cutter Service, 1898. Man, that talk about heroes of putting their entire lives on the line just to help some, as you said, Nick, try to get the last dollar out of their season whalers. Yeah, and like I said, these guys are sailors. This overland expeditions are not exactly their job description. Fake it till you make it, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that is that is, I think, the equivalent of taking me or you, Nick, and putting us in a naval vessel and go sail this in 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 hospital terrain. That is, I guess, the same equivalency. Yeah, it's it's crazy that those guys survived. That they're able to do it in such short a time. I mean, that, that's that's pretty incredible for doing sled dogs and reindeer. Took what four, three, three and a half, four months to go a thousand five hundred miles through blizzards. Where you have to walk in front of your dogs to make a path so the dogs can carry the sleds. Like, I can't, I can't even imagine the mindsets they have to be in. Or, like, what mental tricks they use to keep themselves going. Because I, I gotta imagine the idea to stop and rest for a little day. Like you were saying with the Christmas, where they they almost thought about delaying for Christmas. They're like, nope, no days off. We're just gonna keep powering up and down hills and mountains through thick snow, blizzards, negative 40 degrees winds that are just god it got to be almost tilting you sideways and the crazy thing is too so they get to point barrow on march 30th the bear doesn't come to pick them up until the 28th of july so they have to once they get there they still have to care for all those men keep them alive like you said suppress mutinies can you imagine going through all of that shit and you come up and people like well i think i should be in charge like sit the fuck back down (laughs) (laughs) they're lucky they didn't bring any muskets or else they they would have just shot those mutineers thanks for listening to the backyard philosophy podcast we rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up so let us know what we forgot 
And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.